person talking about love Nine brother is the preacher And it seems nobody's interested in learning But the teacher What's up, guys? Welcome to this episode of the Chalk Talk Podcast. Today we are live via Skype with holder of the world record in the squat at 198 pounds and IFBB Pro bodybuilder Amit Sapir. Amit, how's it going? Good, good. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thanks a lot for coming on, man. We got a shit ton of questions for you, uh, but first, why don't you just talk to us a little bit about uh, about yourself, just kind of where you're at numbers-wise, maybe what you have coming up. Uh, right now, I'm preparing for both of bosses too, and uh, if God willing and I'll stay healthy, that will be my next meet. Um, hopefully, to hit 800 four times body weight at 198, that's, that's awesome. the ultimate goal. Um, and after that, if I can get this number, I'm debating to go up to the 220 category uh, and chase the I think it's Jordan Wong record now, not Dan's anymore. Um, and after that, another two bodybuilding shows. And then hopefully rest a bit. Yeah. So which one? Which one do you like uh, more, bodybuilding or powerlifting? It's such different sports, man. The only connection between those two is that you lift weights. Sure. But power, for me, powerlifting is more of a sport. Right. So yeah. I'm going to a powerlifting meet, and if I lift the most, I win. There's besides bullshit on Facebook. There's judges. They'll tell you if you, if you got the lift or you didn't, and it ends there. In bodybuilding, it's about 50% how you look and 50% other things. Yeah. yeah. If, it, if it's politics, if it's who you know, it's about... So, it's half of a sport, half of a beauty pageant. That's, a, that's originally why the, <laughs> why the reason I started powerlifting. Uh, my last bodybuilding show, for me, I think I looked at my best and I heard from the head judge, oh, we're sorry, your 10 was bad, so we didn't place you well. So, I was like, okay. If after 16 weeks of dieting, this is the answer I'm getting, I'm like... Maybe it's, it's time to try something else. Yeah, I'm like at twenty uh, percent body fat right now, and I get asked all the time if I'm about ready for a show. <laughs> <laughs> you are, man. You're ready right now. Yeah. You, can probably, you can probably do well at a local show. Actually, I'm prepping right now. <laughs> yeah, I actually, um, you know, I talk to a lot of people about, you know, obviously bodybuilding has never been kind of my thing, but um, the dedication it takes, you know, it's. Definitely, definitely hard. You know, I've dieted before to get down from like just like 232 down to 220 for a competition, and I'm a cranky little bitch. So I couldn't imagine doing that for a long period of time for a show, man. Like that's, to me, that's just crazy. You know, for me, I'm looking at it just like it's my job, right? No one's putting a gun to my head to do it. I'm getting paid to compete in those shows. So it's no one's fault that I'm dieting. So, you know. Yeah. You're, yeah. you, I was an asshole when I started, but, you know, <laughs> you're losing a few people that you actually care about, and then you, you learn. Yeah. And at, the, at this point, it's just, okay, it's my choice, it's what I do, and no, no, one, no one else needs to suffer from it. So how does your wife do while you're dieting? Is she, uh, she kind of on the same page as you? She knows you're going to be a little cranky? She's competing too, right? She's doing oh, cigarette man. powerlifting with me, so she... She understand where I was going, but she was nothing but supportive through my whole career. She's like, I'm the, I, I cooked my own meals for the last five years. Yeah. She, she, was, she was great. She was always helpful and always, always supportive. I'm really lucky in that uh, area. Yeah. I, you know, funny story with me. Um, I was dieting for a competition. Night before weigh-ins, I had to go and cut weight. And so I was sitting in a sauna for a few hours. I came home, and my girlfriend was uh, baking brownies. And the whole house smelled like brownies. And I flipped <laughs> out. <laughs> I was so mad. I was cussing. I was kicking stuff. I mean, I just threw a baby temper tantrum. And uh, fortunately, she understands, you know, because she, she does um, Olympic lifting and power lifting. So she understands cutting weight and kind of took it easy on me. But I was a dick. I, I, I had a lot of those situations. I'll tell you what, now I have two kids. It's even harder because you can't tell the kids, hey, don't have this in the house or don't have that. Yeah. Like in my first year before the kids, when I qualified to the Olympia and did like bigger shows, that it was just me. So I told the wife, there's nothing in the house. If you want to eat, go outside to McDonald's for all I care. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, now it, it's harder. The, the more people you have around you and the more adult I guess you get, getting way, way harder. 
Well, let's just jump right into this, man. Like, what kind of got you into lifting weights? Like, what was the whole beginning of your legacy you got going? Well, I started when I was, I think, 12 or 13 in track and field. And I, I had some, like, rough childhood a little bit. So that that's what kept me, like, out of trouble. And I got to about 16 or 15, and I got 100 meters of, like, 10.6 and a long jump of 7 meters. And I told my coach back then that I was like, okay, I want to go to the Olympics. And he looked at me, and I was probably 5'2 at that point. Yeah. <laughs> he was like, listen, I love you, but not here. So he told, me, he told me to go and try to do Olympic weightlifting, and this is where it started. So I competed there, and I fell in love right away. I, if not my injury for the Olympics, I would probably still compete in that. That was my first love. Wow. Is that kind of why you transitioned over into bodybuilding out of the Olympic lifting then? Yes. Yeah, so, so after... Just uh, before the Olympics, I tore my infraspinatus, and the recover from a rotator cuff there back then was close to two years before oh, you wow. can actually train, like 18 months or more. Today is about a year, and when the doctor looked at me and told me, okay, you need to do the surgery, I said, fuck you, I'm, I'm not going to. I, I couldn't think about the fact that I'm not going to train for two whole years. It's just not something I could handle with. So I said, okay, what, what can I do if it's not max lift? So I just started doing reps. And wow. then I, I, someone told me, "Hey, you have, you have good, you have good base. Try bodybuilding." And I, I, after six months of doing it, I entered my first local show and I won. So I, okay, I can do, be pretty good of that, at that. And after two years, I got my pro card and just went on from there. Wow, that's, that's pretty, crazy. It's pretty quick turnaround to get a pro card. How many shows did it take to do that? Uh, so for national, I won national three times, and then the fourth time I won the overall. And I got top five in the European champs, and that guy, how I got my pro card. So I think six shows. Okay. All together. I competed a lot at the start because I had to learn how to diet and how to manipulate them. So in my first three years, I probably did six or seven shows, like two, what, two or three times a year. What type of uh, nutrition strategy did you find works the best? Because I know that you, you plan nutrition for a lot of the top guys now. Um, what's kind of your style as far as putting together meal planning? For performance? Straight up, carbs is your best friend. If you know how to time carbs right, if you know how to manipulate them right in your diet, that will always be a superior energy source. Mm -hmm. I, I try fat with people, and if I, if I have to put a person, everyone is different. Let's start with that, right? But if I had to take a general percentage, if you do it right, and you know how to time your carbs right, and how to put them right in the diet, 90% of the people will react a lot better to high-carb, medium to high-carbs diet. Wow. Interesting. That's How about then strictly for, sorry, no, strictly for um, like aesthetics like you were doing with bodybuilding? Well, it's different then, right? Because so if you don't mind your performance getting hurt in the gym, so if you want to train like a pussy, so yeah, you can get away with lower carbs diet. I know for me, it was never like, I'm, I'm not the guy that will go into a gym and do cable push downs and go out. It's just yeah. not how I train, right? So. But it's it's doable. I still, but even when it comes to bodybuilding, if you wanted this full hard look on stage, carbs will usually, from my experience, usually will affect you a lot better. It's just about it's not just a free license to eat carbs as much as you want. You do need to know where exactly to put them and how to manipulate them. But if you do those things right, then it's always superior. I think I've been screwing this up the whole time, man. When I hear this like war on carbs. I thought we were supposed to eat as many as you could, like get rid of them. <laughs> so I didn't understand how come I went from 220 to 240 in just a few weeks. <laughs> yeah, that's good. You know, what kind of got me um, steering your way was a while ago, um, you know, a lot of the top lifters started talking about you and about how you were making these drastic changes to their diet, but it was like simple changes for them. But they were having like, I don't want to, make it sound like it's not a big deal, but it like seemed like overnight success with their dieting, especially people that were like in a 308 weight class or even higher um, were right away having huge success with whatever you were having them do. Uh, I think, again, my first word will, with every diet, with every person, be individual. Like I can give 10 people 10 different diets, right? Everyone have different needs, different amount of muscle, different way of training. Different metabolism. It, it's all so all of those factors will affect their diet. But more than anything, what I believe is frequent changes. I think a diet can work great for a week, for two weeks, and then your body adjusts, or all of a sudden you're 
life changed a bit. You have, you have more activity, less activity. Things change. So the diet should change accordingly. I think mistakes a lot of coaches do is like, okay, here's the diet. I'll change it next month. It's not how I do things. I usually change my client diet weekly, sometimes biweekly. It really, really depends. But as long as it keeps changing and as long as you keep doing things according to their lifestyle, then it's easy to get really good changes. Yeah. But with powerlifters, there's another thing. There's a big difference between what you want to eat <laughs> and what you need to eat. Yeah. And the minute they get that, so it's, the changes are very drastic, right? Not a lot of people need to eat 5,000 calories a day to, to perform well. Yeah. They're very rare. Most people with 3,000 calories and good training will perform 100%, probably better if they'll eat, if they'll eat them a little bit less. So how big of... Um... How big of a deal is it, do you think, to have kind of like an exit strategy with dieting? Because for me personally, I had huge success on carb backloading. Um, so I essentially went from 286 down to 220 in roughly about eight months, nine months or so. Um, a huge success for me. You know, my diet was shit before that. And uh, one of the things I found is kind of once I reached my goal, I was like, oh, well, fuck it. I'm here. I'm going to just kind of do whatever I want. And now... For me personally, trying to cut back down to 220 or 198, this is by far the hardest time uh, for me because I really didn't have an exit strategy leaving uh, backloading. You feel that's important? It's, I think it's very important. So your body likes more than anything one word. You like balance, like homostasis. If you, if you don't keep it there, your body will always look for ways to go up, to go down. You want to create a base point, a new normal point. The only way to do it is by gradual changes. So let's say you dieted from 280 to 220. When you get to 20 and you want to start eating again, it has to be very gradually. Yeah. So you add a little bit mm -hmm. of carbs in the first week, a little bit more fat in the next week. And according to how your body reacts, then you're slowly, slowly going back up. I had I had a client, Leslie, who wanted to get a shot of. So Dustin Reed, the yeah. different mm -hmm. both of us. So he started in a really high body fat. And we cut him down, cut him down, cut him down, relatively low calories. I think right now he's eating more than he ate when he was, when we just started, but he's with the same body fat that when we ended the diet. Wow. And all of that was because we did stuff very slow, very gradually. Right. Every week we added a little bit. Okay, are you getting fat? You're not getting fat. You're good. Okay, let's add a little bit more. Okay, now you're stuck. Let's add a little bit of cardio. Let's add, lower the carbs and then add again. As long as you keep your body not... Uh, in the same place and in homostasis that everything would be good. Do you have any of your diets that include like 24 packs of Coors Lights? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I wish, but no. No, shit. <laughs> no, 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 no Pop-Tarts in my diet. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's one thing that's killing me um, that I really want to know. Uh, back when we were talking uh, when you were in GPC um, competing, I think you opened up at what, like 709? 706. The world record was 705, and then I opened with 706. And you missed it, your first attempt, right? Oh yeah, that was my first ever powerlifting meet, right? So I was, in, I, I was in my head. I was like, I did it before. I did weightlifting before. It's not a big deal. Well, apparently, it was a big deal. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah so I, I that's weird. That up. Your first powerlifting competition, you're breaking a world record. That's crazy. <laughs> so Ed Cohn came over to you. After you missed it, and he said something, what, did you say, quit being a pussy, or what did he say to get you fired up? He just looked at me, he told me, relax, and do your normal squat. That's it. And then the next time I, I came to the bar, I, I said, okay, just just do what you're doing every time in the gym. Nothing, no, no psyching up, nothing crazy, just go under the bar and squat like you always do. And it worked like magic. I, I was so... Okay, I'm going to break a world record. I'm, I'm excited. I'm this. I'm that. And mm -hmm. I thought on everything beside the actual squad. And then once I got all of this bullshit out of my head, everything went fine. So then in that competition, you eventually hit 722, right? Yeah, yeah. And how'd you feel after you did that? Like, I know, like you're saying, it's your first one. For me, you know, every, like everything's been really drawn out. You know, I've been competing for a long time. And so for me, like, I almost started crying when I got to that spot. You were kind of new into powerlifting. Was it like a different emotion for my, you? That was my best day of my pro career. Up until yeah. today, if I, if I need to point one happy moment in my life, this is it. 
in my pro in my pro life. Like this and the day my kids were born are probably the two happiest days of my life. Wow. All, all I what since I started professional sport, all I ever wanted was to be the best in the world. Yeah. No matter what, but to be but to get up one morning and to say I want to be I, I'm the only one in the world that in this situation can do what I just did. And when it happened, it was like 20 years of, of chasing after something and hoping for something that was always like so close, but I never got that. So when I got out, I'm like, Jesus, like, that's it. I did it. That's awesome. So you finished with 722, and then later, um, this last competition you did, you did 766, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. And you feel like you are you can close that gap to 800? Two things. So right after the GPA, I, I set my eyes on doing ROM. Mm-hmm. Back, and it was supposed to be in February. Three weeks into the prep, I'm deadlifting and I'm, and I'm tearing my hamstring. Oh. Uh, yeah, so, and I'm like, that was my first real, like, complete tear. And that was my first serious lower body injury. I had, before the GPA, I had two biceps tears. But that was the first, I'm like, oh, fuck. That, like, how am I going to squat now? So this whole prep going to this this meet was about 16 weeks or 18 weeks, and eight of them was just basically being crippled and going to, like, therapy. My massage therapist, Leah Davis, basically saved my life. Uh, I remember still up in this, going to her office, like, basically crippled. And, like, but I need to squat, do something. And she just took me week after week, treating, like, five hours, five hours of treating the week and just got me back to life. Wow. So after this this competition... It was more than anything, it was a relief, more than happiness. Because it's like so many people helped me to get to this point that I can compete again. So, like, if I'm letting any of those people down, I'm going to kill myself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do your kids, uh, your kids ever ask to go to the gym? My, I have a two year old that's already squatting. Oh, and, my, <laughs> and a three and a half year old that just deadlifting with me today. I think I even posted a video of that. Wow. So, not, <laughs> There's no better feeling than to see your kids doing what you do. Yeah. Yeah, I know my boy came in and trained with me and Jaren a few weeks back, and uh, it's kind of the first time that he's really pushed to want to come into the gym, and it was a great feeling to know you know, he wanted to come in. And I told him he should skip leg day, but he didn't. He, of course, he did leg, so <laughs> so stupid. <laughs> I got I to keep him balanced. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things that's kind of admirable about you is that um, you don't do, like, these backdoor – or backyard meets, you know, you don't go to some guy's, you know, gym that's your buddy that, you know, is going to pass everything for you. I mean, you're doing, like, big-time meets that are, you know, judged by some of the best judges around. Not a lot of people do that that are at your level. You know, do you plan all your training around those kind of meets? It's always better for me to compete against the best. This is why I'm doing both of bosses, too. Like, I know Jesse Norris is going to be there, and I want to finally go head-to-head with him and see who's better, right? That's yeah. the whole that was my whole point of picking this me. Um, I don't know. It's not. I, I learned one thing when I start when I came to the GPA and I just hung out with the Little Bridges and I hung out with Dan Green and Brandon and all of those guys. I was so happy. I was like, "Wow, powerlifting is so awesome! Like the community is good. There's camaraderie." And then I came back home, opened Facebook, and I was like, "Okay, that I know." <laughs> so what I learned from the last few months is no matter what you'll do, I'll squat a thousand. I'll squat fifteen hundred. People will always have something to say. Oh yeah, so yeah. You're, you're trying to you're trying to minimize that. So you're going to those big meets. You're trying to do what you can. But eventually, if for me, if I get the validation from the people I actually care about, and those the actually high level judges, and those the people that actually know what they're talking about, then I'm happy. Well, yeah. that's something that we've even talked about on the show before. Is that something that uh, the powerlifting is really missing? Is that direct head to head competition with the best in the sport? Because of all the different federations, it's real easy to kind of run and hide and just, you know, go and hit a number and not actually compete against anybody. And we were talking about how if, the, if powerlifting is going to go more mainstream or start to get more notoriety and respect, we need to have the best people in the sport going head-to-head do, with each other, kind of like with what's going on at uh, Boss of Bosses too. I, I completely agree. I think it, the problem is that so many people are pulling to different directions. So it, it, it's it's so hard, right? This is why, like for me, if there's a, a big big meet, come and do it, guys. Like, yeah. here's our chance yeah. to actually put a good meet together. This, this is why GPA was so good. Like every almost every single good lifter was there. Right? Yeah, yeah. It makes so much more when you actually beat, win this, beat these people. So training for the bosses to bosses, um, are you um, 
Are you what? What are you training your body weight at right now? Right now, I'm sitting at two ten. I, I I was I had a dental surgery, so I lost some weight. But usually, I'm cutting from. I'm trying to keep my weight relatively low now when I'm competing in powerlifting. But I usually cut from two fifteen to thirteen, wherever. If the, the the cleanest I eat, the low the lower I, I weigh. But yeah. I'm mm-hmm. giving myself a little bit more freedom right now. It's not like complete bodybuilding diet, so. So, usually the, around 210, 215. And how difficult is that? Because you're traveling um, to California for this meet. So, like, you know, with flying and kind of getting adjusted into a hotel and all that, does any of that kind of affect you or does that make it more difficult for you? It's, it, it obviously make it less comfortable, but I did it so many times in bodybuilding. I, I'm so used to travel with, with Tupperware full of food and dehydrate myself and, and, and be cranky for weeks. So, for me to suffer one week of uh, water load and some dehydration, uh, it sucks. <laughs> but it's, the end of the world. it's just one week. It's like, so what's worse in your mind, water loading or dehydration? Oh, dehydration! I can, I can, I can drink. I, the last, the night before weighing is horrid. Or yeah, going in and out of those showers, it's like, oh. I complain during both times when I'm drinking water and I got to get up and pee every seven minutes. I'm pissed off about that, <laughs> but then when I I'm dehydrated. Then the water I'm gets thirsty. taken away. Yeah. There's like no making me happy. <laughs> no, it's, the whole process sucks. There's no, no 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 question about it. But it is what it is, right? Oh man, that's crazy. Um, Let's but, talk but about. Then you, uh, but then you'll have your IPF guys saying like, "Oh, but it's not two hours weighing." <laughs> 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 like you can't you, you can't win no matter what you do. Yo, no, I think. Those, uh, I, I think you know you've made it when people are talking shit about you on the internet. Yeah, exactly. That is that, definitely that, where you've made an impact. <laughs> Brandon told me that once. Yeah, that's like, okay, that's it. I made it. I got, I got my hater, so I'm happy now. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, um, so what does your what does your training look like now that you're setting up to, to kind of go for that 800 squat? And how is it maybe I, different than something that you've done in the past? First of all, I'm taking 800 as my max now. Like all my percentages, everything I'm playing going by 800. I just so I just after the last meet, the uh, world record meet, like three weeks ago, I took three weeks with about 70 percent, and mm-hmm. this week I'm going to start ramping up again. And I did the math from where where I am right now: 20, 30 pounds a week, and I'm squatting right now just once a week. That mm-hmm. should be good enough. So you're following more of like just a straight linear progression then, all the way up till the meet. Um. Not exactly. Well, for, with the main lift, yeah. With the main lift, if I feel good, I'll try to go up every weight and lower the reps every week. Mm-hmm. With the accessory exercise, I'm, I'm keep changing all the time. It's, it's still be the basic stuff, so it will be pause squat and deficit deadlift and close grip bench. But I'll change bar, I'll add band, I'll add chain. Depends mm-hmm. what I'm trying to achieve in the specific session. But yeah, the, the main lift is basically just basically in a presentation, trying to go up as much as I can. I also what I what I add I took this from Chris Duffin. I'm using using the push band now, mm-hmm. so I'm so I have the velocity of the of every lift. So I usually pick a number that I can't go under it. So and if I'm if the bar getting too slow, then okay, I'm done for the day. If I keep the speed nice and high, I'll I'll keep doing a few more sets. Okay, but so you're my, so you're kind of progressing everything from week to week, but you're using the the bar speed to dictate your volume for that session. Exactly, exactly. So if, if, I'll, if I'll feel good and I see the speed is keep, keep being high, I'll do three, four more sets. And if not, I'll cut it short. But, yeah, that will be my main thing to dictate what I'm doing the exact session. How do you um, go, go about picking whatever uh, accessory movement you're going to use since you tend to rotate them? I usually stick to the basics. So, again, pause squat for, for squat day and definitely dead for the, that day and close grip for, uh, or incline for bench day. Mm-hmm. But then it's, it's a lot going by if, I, if I'm hurting. If, like my, if I have some sort of pain for some exercise, I'll switch. So my bicep, usually after squat, my biceps bug me. So I'll go to mm-hmm. a yoke bar uh, pause squat or a buffalo bar pause squat. Um, if my shoulder bug me, I usually do the close, the close grip as opposed to the incline. It's usually by, okay, that feels good today. Let, let's do that one. It's not yeah. excessive. I change it like every, literally every workout at this point. Interesting. Was that something that you did in your your preps in the past, or is that fairly recent? So here, the way. So for me, because I'm doing the the other way, I'm coming from bodybuilding into powerlifting. I have enough muscle right now mm-hmm. that can that be, 
is good enough for powerlifters. So the only stuff that I need to improve for me is one, learning how to handle heavy weights on a regular basis and to improve my neural efficiency. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm focusing most of the time. This is why I'm, I'm pretty loose with my accessories because I don't need to build new muscle. I just, I'm using what I have. Yeah. And just the main lift is the, is the, is the, is the main factor of the workout. So did you find, because I, I got kind of my start into lifting with bodybuilding training as well. And one of the things that I really struggled with transitioning into powerlifting is I was very good at handling weight for reps, but I didn't have the same skill of being able to handle, you know, a max single. So I would hit things for, you know, if I could get it for one, I could get it for six to eight reps. But if I tried to make what I should be able to hit for a single happen, I just wasn't able to do it. Have you found that uh, you've had to have that same transition with going from the more higher volume focus on the contraction type training to just straight so, power and strength? So as a bodybuilder, I always trained heavy. Not singles, but I did triples, sometimes doubles. So it wasn't that big of a transition. Okay. But definitely but definitely to now to do like like five five doubles right now is is very different. Like my, I feel my nervous system change as back to how it felt when I was a weightlifter as opposed to how I train as a bodybuilder. It, mm -hmm. it, it takes a lot more time to use to handle those repeatedly heavy sets but yeah but it's, it's improving I, I i can say that now after in november i'll do powerlifting for a year so just now i'm starting to feel a little bit more good with just doing like heavier weights all the time yeah so uh talk to us about bio test it's kind of you talked a little bit about in your uh, article with t nation about um some of the stacks you put together prepping for your meat uh, talk to us a little bit about the product. Well, first of all, this company is a blessing for me. Without them and their uh, support of me, I don't think I would be ever, never close to what I just did in the last year. They're like, you know, you hear about supplement companies that just give supplements to the athletes and, and send them away. Yeah. This company, mm -hmm. everything I ask, everything I ever ask, they're there, they're taking care of me, and it's something I appreciate so much on top of that they i honestly believe they have the best supplement in the world like their intra workout nutrition the plasma is revolutionary like it changed my set my workouts like probably forever longer workouts better recovery and every 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 product they have is just pure quality i like one of the one of the things in the article said that uh you know you're a, a professional lifter and you know obviously a huge muscle mass, so you're taking like four or five servings of some of this stuff, and they say, for everybody else, just take the normal <laughs> serving size. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm using a lot of supplements. Not... <laughs> yeah. you got to get it like a shipment in a crate. <laughs> <laughs> the laundry scooper. So talk to us about the plasma. What do you like about that? So, first of all, I, 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 a lot of people missing how important interim, interim work of nutrition is. It's probably, if I, if I had to pick one supplement that I use, this would be it. So if I could train before that for an hour and a half and I would be toast, I can train for three hours now and I'm completely fine. Wow. If you get up the next morning and you're sore, now you're, ah, it's not that bad. So you can train more frequency. You can train, you can increase your frequency. You can train longer. What? So obviously you're going to advance faster, right? Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of people missing this. More than that, when you're drinking and getting mo most of your carbs into a workout, you're chance to actually get in fed of that is close to zero because your body is literally utilized that while you're training. The, the absorption is so good because of the quality of the those ingredients. Then it's like it's like basically eating a meal while you're training. So you're wow. not getting as catabolic and you can train and you can recover so much faster. Man, are you taking uh are you taking uh anything from any other companies? No. Nothing. Just bio test. That's bio test. They have everything they need. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. What do you got? My phone keeps shutting down. I gotta pull it back up here. You need a charger? I hear your Facebook's ringing up there. I'm not sure why. <laughs> me. So, uh, we'll go back a little bit. You said in that Teen Nation article. Um, back when you were ten years old, you wanted you told your dad you wanted to be the best at something. What kind of gave you that drive? I mean, I think, um, I mean, every athlete wants to be good at something. But at ten years old, how did you know at ten years old you wanted to be good at something? 
you know what? I remember looking at Ben Johnson and Curry Lewis in the Olympics. And I remember seeing Ben Johnson winning at a time before all the math. And I, and I literally still remember the picture looking at my dad and I'm like, this, I, I want to be there. I, I, I guess the feeling of winning was always like something that made me feel so good. So it was like do everything I can to win. It's, it's hard to explain. I think this, this insane drive to be the best and to win is really bad for every other factor in your life. Yeah, <laughs> it don't necessarily make you the nicest person in the world. But it's, yeah. it's really, it's good for sport. It, it was always there. When if I did a trick and film it when I was fucking well, I was so pissed if I if I didn't win. I was so happy when I did, and and it just kept rolling from there. Were your parents I'm, athletes? I'm, I'm, sorry. Were your parents athletes? Yeah, my mom was a trick and field athlete. My dad wasn't. No. <laughs> and was in the military all of his life, so no. Oh, wow. So I'm sure when you told him you wanted to be the best at something, he's like, yeah, whatever. He, he, he told me to go to the Army to be a combat uh, soldier. I told him no. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't your path, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's something else to kind of have that drive at such a young age. You know, I feel like I've always been fairly competitive my whole life, but it kind of really didn't start until I got into high school. Kind of before that, it just kind of seemed like, well, yeah, sports are cool, but... It's more just a chance to hang out. It took me much longer in life before I realized, you know, shit, I really, really do want to be serious with this. You know, for me, I, I remember in bodybuilding, if it, I love the sport. I love to look like that. I like, I even like the diet part. But if there was, was one thing there that killed me every single time, is that you can't control on the final outcome. It's like you can work your ass off, you can look at your best, and you can still lose. And, yeah. I've, and, and that's what I, I like so much about powerlifting. It's like it's an absolute sport, right? You live the most, you win. And like it, it, for my how I think and how my head works, it's so it works so much better. Because I know if I will work hard and I'll do my best, I won. And if not, well, someone was actually better and have nothing to do with other factors. Yeah. So how do you think? One of the things that we've uh, we've noticed with the people that we've interviewed here that are you know, all top-level athletes in, in whatever discipline they happen to participate in. One of the thing that, things that we've noticed is that drive and that dedication and that work ethic to actually become a top-level athlete, and you've, you know, done it in multiple sports, that's something that carries over into the rest of their life and the, the person that they are. How is, how is that something that's, that's kind of affected everything else that you've got going on? So like, everything I do, I want to be the best. In. No, no, no matter what I do, I'll always give every every single thing I have. Whatever work I can put into it, I will. Again, in personal relation, it's probably not the best quality to have because you're less patient and you're, I, I don't know, for me, when I see someone who is unmotivated or doesn't want to work out or make excuses, it can piss me off so bad. Yeah. And I'll show it to the person. I, I'm, I'm so bad in putting, like, showing myself. So <laughs> I'm really bad in politics when it comes to those stuff. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but it, but in sport in, in in everything in life I wanted to achieve I know it's about putting my eyes on something no matter what I'll get it I'll find a way it will take a year it will take 10 years but if I actually want this thing I'm going to get it no matter what it is in life and I, I truly believe that anyone if he's willing actually willing to work hard enough he can get whatever he wants Mo- most people are fucking lazy that, that, yeah yeah, yeah. Who are some of the guys you look up to with like bodybuilding or like bo- or uh, powerlifting? Who are the kind of the guys you feel that uh, you know help you kind of get keep spinning? Bodybuilding first one popping to my head is Branch Warren. He was the guy that helped me to get into the Olympia. He prepped me for that specific show that I qualified from, and his work ethic is, is second to none. I know if you watch what, some of his videos, but mm-hmm. the, he's coming. He's coming to do work. So in bodybuilding, this would be the first person I'll, I'll look up to, both in terms of how he looks, because I like the freak look. I don't like aesthetic, nice physique. I just like to look like a freak. Yeah. So both how he looks and also how he trains. Powerlifting, Brandon Lilly, everything this dude went through, and also knowing him personally, just for me, it's inspiring to see that he's keep pushing. Her. Every time I'm thinking, oh, it's hard for me, or I'm thinking about feeling sorry for myself for something, I'm like, look what Brandon went through, and I'm like, fuck that. Like, yeah, yeah, it's pretty it's, tough. Like, yeah, so those are the two people that will pop into my head. And so what do you do to get fired up before, like, a training cycle or a training session? Um, do you tra- you train at your house? 
yeah, I, I, I couldn't train in commercial gyms anymore. I was, okay, last, I, I remember my last session in a commercial gym, it was actually a powerlifter-friendly gym. Someone came to me and like, how long are you going to hog the squat rack? And I looked at him like, yes. yeah. And I think there was like six plates on the bar, and I was like, like just about going into a set. Like, okay, it's either I'm going to jail or someone's going to die. <laughs> So that was I, I thought. I thought, okay, we we move. I need I need my own space to train in. So and yeah, I, I'm putting my music. I'm just going. And I'm, I, I don't need stuff to get fired up. It's, I, from the age of ten till today, I'm still enjoying every second in the gym. It's like it, it's what I did since I was a kid. It's fun for me. So with you, so, just going into the gym, you're just kind of clocking in to do work and. Yeah, it, it, it's it's my job. I'm going there and I'm do, doing everything. I, if I don't, if I leave the session. And I need to ask myself if there was anything else I could have done. And if the answer is no, I'm happy. So you never find it difficult training at home to have that kind of little bit of lack of motivation? I guess for me, you know, I've trained a couple of times, like, in a small environment or in, like, a home gym. And for me, like, sometimes it's tough for me to get fired up. Um, I, I would have a tough time training in and out every day in, like, a home gym or just by myself trying to find that motivation to keep you going. You, you never run into those kind of days? Um, I always want to train. I'll say, like, I, I never get up in the morning. I don't want to be in the gym. If it's a heavy day, maybe if there was, like, people I actually trust, uh, maybe it will help if they're <laughs> going to be there. But I usually train with my wife. Yeah. And I train with those quarters. She's just taking videos. And, it's like, I don't know. I, if, if I had to make a choice if you train in a commercial gym or at home, for most of the time it would be at home. Yeah. 100%. And it's also different, man, where I, I'm from Canada and there's no, at least for where I live, there's not a lot of people that are actually that serious. So if I end up, when I had training partner, I ended up being the coach. It's not the training partner. It's like, okay, yeah. I need to do this. It's, it's not, it's not them pushing me. It's me training them and then I need to train myself. Yeah. If I if I had someone like you to bench with or someone like, I don't know, to, to squat with, it's a different story, right? You train together, but when yeah. you don't have that then I, I, I'll take it to train alone because then I can do my own thing. Yeah. That's something that I run into too is just and you end up having a hard time taking that coach hat off and just everything kind of gets blurred and you end up putting more into the, the training relationship than you're getting out of it. Exactly. That, that's, that for me was the hardest part with training partners. Like I had a few good ones, but even then it always started there with my clients and then say, okay, you need to do this, you need to fix that, and then fuck, I need to squat God knows what. And yeah. my energy even there yeah you ever find that it's hard to uh separate your training time from your family time since you're training at the house uh when i'm squatting uh, the grandparents are living like literally five minutes from here my wife's parents so they're just coming and taking the kids so it's like okay. just me and wife so that's that's, that's nice. that. and then if it's light training days or stuff that are not like that demand so much mental concentration then yeah it doesn't matter I have my three-year-old, like, I had a, like, a light deadlift session today, so with five plates, like, go, daddy, go. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there's not, there's no better motivation than that. I'm like, if you know, when your son's standing there yelling, go, daddy, for me, it's like, there's not, not, nothing, nothing can make me feel better than that. It's crazy, because when I met you at um, the EPC competition in Portland, Oregon, um, that was the first competition my kids have ever been to. And, uh, and it was quite the moment, you know, my boy, um, I asked him to go get me some chalk and he came back with a, with a little stick of chalk he used for chalkboards because <laughs> he didn't know any better. And, uh, he found some on the ground and brought it over to me. He's like, here you go, dad. I was like, nah, that's not it. But some of the stuff that they said to me, um, just before I lifted are things I'll never forget. Um, and certainly helped me, you know, want to do the best I could for them. Since it was their kind of their first invi- you know chance to be in that kind of environment, have have your kids been to one of your competitions yet? Not yet. I'm, I think I'm going to take the oldest oldest one uh, this year. I hope he'll be in one of them. If I'll do it like a local meet in Canada. Yeah. The little one still doesn't completely understand. Yeah. But I'll tell you one thing, man. If I know if my kid will actually understand and watch me compete, I'm not going to fuck up this competition. Yeah. <laughs> not, fuck up. Yeah. <laughs> I was. Uh, I was pretty disappointed when I missed my final attempt at that competition, but uh, it was uh, it was awesome when I went back down and handed my wrist straps to my kids, and they're like, "Hey, Dad, it's all right. You did awesome." And uh, so just them being there and being around, they actually got to go up and be on stage while I lifted, and it was an amazing feeling. So good luck with that. It's uh, 
It's, I, I guarantee you'll start crying at some point. <laughs> Probably, 100%. Man. <laughs> I'm a little bitch when it comes to that shit. I start same. crying over everything. Exact same, man. Awesome. So let's just recap here. What uh, what do you got come got uh, coming up? You have the so, bosses to the bosses. Boss two in yeah in like seven weeks now I think, and then well I'm going to do uh, I'm going to have a little test meet here in Vancouver in uh, four weeks, but I'm just using it as a heavy day. And after boss of bosses two depends how it goes. If I'm going to hit eight hundred, I think I'm going to give it a little bit time rest and do a bodybuilding show. If not, I'll consider one of the world champs in November. Not sure which one yet, but and then after that, definitely some rep. This is going to be my fourth powerlifting meet if I'll do November. So it's time to give my poor body a little bit of a rest before I'll injure again. Yeah. <laughs> Have you got any plans of coming back to Portland anytime soon? Oh yeah, I'm, I'm talking to Chris all the time. I'm, I'm really, I'm going to be there. There's a student Stu McGill seminar in August sixth. Okay. Seven. Yeah, so I'm going to be there for sure. It's a, an amazing opportunity to learn. So. I'm probably going to get a few sessions there so we can train. Maybe you can teach me how to bench. Yeah, well, well the <laughs> trick is you just lift anymore. your legs up. You can't use your legs. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to do that, man. I think it would be a lot of fun to hook up and uh, and get a bench session in. Definitely. Maybe, Maybe you can I teach me how to squat. I not bench like a bitch anymore. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that would be awesome, man. Well, I really appreciate you coming on and being a part of this. Um you know, one of the things I think a lot of people don't understand is I think uh, you're one of the best squatters in the world. And uh, I, I think a lot of that's overlooked because of your body weight. You know, being down at 198, everybody doesn't – nobody thinks that somebody at 198 can squat what you squat. So they kind of overlook some of that. But one of the things you need to understand is you're a force to be reckoned with. And I have no doubt that 800 is going to fly up and you're going to be the best squatter in the world. Thank you so much, man. I really appreciate it. And thank you for having me. Yeah, thanks a lot, man. I really appreciate it. And I'll see you guys in Portland soon. All right, buddy. All right. Thanks a lot. Take care. Take care. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.